The first author must state that his co-author and close friend, Tom Trobeau, quite intelligent, singularly original, and inordinately generous, killed himself consequent to endogenous depression. 94 days later, in my dream, Tom's simulacrum remarked, the direct limit characterization of perfect complexes shows that they extend, just as one extends a coherent sheaf. Awaking with a start, I knew this idea had to be wrong, since some perfect complexes have a non-vanishing K-naught obstruction to extension. I had worked on this problem for three years, and saw this approach to be hopeless. But Tom's simulacrum had been so insistent, I knew he wouldn't let me sleep undisturbed until I had worked out the argument and could point to the gap. This work quickly led to the key results of this paper. To Tom, I could have explained why he must be listed as a co-author. More on that in the end of the video. Hey, welcome to MATLAB Balance. This is the fourth video in the series K-Theory Wonderland, made with the help of my friend and colleague Peter Hay. In these videos, I try to share with you the beauty and inspiration of abstract math. In the previous two episodes, we talked about the definition of algebraic k-theory. In the first one, we got to see zeroth k-theory, and in the second one, we looked at higher k-groups. Today's video will be the last one dedicated to the definition of k-theory. All of the constructions that we saw before were designed for algebraic varieties. These were geometric shapes cut out by systems of polynomial equations. However, this was not the full truth, and today we will discover a more general picture. As always, a disclaimer, if you don't understand what we are saying in the video, don't feel bad about yourself. Just let the math wash over you or Google the words you don't know. And in case you are feeling particularly curious today, you can find the references and more precise formulations of the math statements in the video description below. The truth that we were hiding from you this whole time is that an algebraic variety can be more general than simply a shape cut out by polynomial equations. It can be glued from a bunch of such shapes, in the same spirit in which in topology a manifold is glued from open disks. An example of such a shape is a projective space, which is a variety that parameterizes lines through the origin. A projective space Pn is not a zero locus of a set of polynomial equations in any affine space, but it is glued out of n plus 1 copies of n-dimensional affine spaces. So it is a typical example of an algebraic variety that we didn't consider before. The mathematical problem that was discussed in the Thomas and Trobo paper, which you saw in the beginning of the video, is the following question how to define k-theory for all algebraic varieties. The paper by Thomas and Trebeau offers an explicit, subtle, yet technical solution to this problem, which we will not discuss in our video. Instead, we will explore an alternative approach, an implicit way to define k-theory for general varieties. One of the features of abstract math that I particularly enjoy is that one object can have several definitions that are of different natures, and this flexibility gives space for creativity within math research. As Richard Thomas said in his interview on my channel, the objective part of math is, of course, the least interesting. And algebraic k-theory is a perfect example of this phenomenon, because it has various definitions which are suited for different purposes. Some are useful for proving abstract properties, others are useful for making computations, and the one you will see right now is, in my opinion, the best suited for doing math outreach, which is a valid purpose per se. The main idea is that, in fact, it suffices to know k-theory of the building blocks, which we have already seen before, and that will determine uniquely k-theory of all algebraic varieties. Now Peter will explain this idea in more detail. We saw the idea of locality when we spoke about vector bundles. Locality is again relevant when studying algebraic varieties. Our basic building blocks are affine varieties. An affine variety is a variety that is cut out globally by a system of polynomial equations. But there are many varieties which are not globally cut out by a system of polynomial equations. So some examples of varieties that are not affine are projective end space, as well as taking an affine plane and removing the origin. So these are locally cut out by systems of polynomial equations, but there's no global polynomial equations defining these spaces. So in general, varieties are glued together from affines. 
glued together in what way? This means that they're covered by affines in a certain topology called the Zariski topology. In order to make sense of K-theory for non-affine varieties, we need to make sense of the idea of what's called a sheaf. So the sheaf terminology, it comes from agriculture, and the plural is sheaves. As motivation, start by making an observation about continuous functions on a topological space. So let T be a topological space, and you're free to take T to be as nice as you like, for example, Rn. The idea that motivates sheaf theory is the following observation, that a continuous function, let's say from T to the real numbers, is uniquely determined by its restriction to any open cover. What does this mean exactly? Well, the first thing to notice is if you have u inside of t, some open, then we get a restriction map that goes from continuous functions from t to r to continuous functions from u to r. And moreover, any time we can write t as a union of some open cover u alpha, we get a way of expressing continuous functions from t to r in terms of these other guys. So there's a bijection between continuous functions from t to r and compatible families f alpha that go from u alpha to r with the property that they agree on further restriction. Continuous functions on a topological space give an example of a sheaf. In the geometric context, we can consider more generally a sheaf on all algebraic varieties, which is an invariant of varieties that satisfies a similar gluing axiom. Such sheaf is completely determined by its values on the fine varieties, since the fine varieties form a basis of the risky topology. An example of such an invariant will be the k-theory space, as we will now see. We want to define k-theory as a sheaf on all varieties. Now we already have a definition that we like for affines. On affines, we defined k-theory so that we take the space of vector bundles on x and we group complete it. Now in general, we want the k-theory space to be determined by this value on affines. So in general, we'll just force this to be the case. So we'll define the k-theory functor to do the following thing. Well, our first approximation would be to take vector bundles and group complete it. But for non-affine varieties, that assignment might not actually glue together. So it might not be a sheaf for the Zersky topology, and in fact it isn't. So what we'll do is we'll take that and we will just force it to be a sheaf. So this Lzar denotes the Zariski sheafification, which means we force the sheaf property. So that's our definition. And that won't change the value on affines. On affines, we'll still get the group completion of vector bundles. But it will make the value of this k-theory space determined by the value on affines. Now we can define the k-theory groups as the homotopy groups of this k-theory space. One of the important features of this abstract definition of k-theory is that k0 is still computable. In a certain sense, k0 is a universal gadget that splits short exact sequences. More precisely, we can describe k0 of x as follows. We start by taking the free abelian group on the set of isomorphism classes of vector bundles on X. Then we quotient by the relation that the class of a vector bundle V is the same as the class of a vector bundle V1 
plus the class of a vector bundle V2 for every short exact sequence that starts with V1, including into V with quotient V2. As we just saw, K-theory space is defined as a sheaf whose values we already knew locally. And as usually, the K-theory groups are its homotopy groups. However, a space is a more abstract object to grasp than groups. So one may ask, why do we need to get to this level of abstraction? Aha, here's the surprising part. While K-theory space is a sheaf, its homotopy groups are not sheaves themselves. They cannot be determined locally. I like to think of a space as a house and of homotopy groups as its floors. While all the interesting stuff happens on the floors, we still think of the whole house as a place to be, and we don't reduce a house to its floors only. Today we met general algebraic varieties, which are glued out of solutions of systems of polynomial equations, called affine varieties. And then we saw what K-theory of general algebraic varieties is. It can be defined as a sheaf whose value on any affine variety is the group completion of the space of vector bundles. In the next video, we will start exploring connections of K-theory with other cool objects in math by looking at the K-theory of the ring of integers. There will be many surprises, I promise. For many of us, death plays an important role in our math life balance. However, we usually avoid talking about it because finding the right words is very hard or impossible. For that reason, I find it incredible that Robert Thomason, a brilliant American mathematician, in his groundbreaking paper on algebraic K-theory, did not just write a dedication to his friend who took his life. No, he had put his friend as a co-author and had written the remarkable explanation that you heard in the beginning, in the introduction to their paper. For me, this is a memorable example of freedom that you can embrace in mathematics and in the math community. Thank you.